Welcome to New Narrow Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sascarts, Sasculture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Hotelling, the administrative assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation. And as uh, some of the astute among you have noticed, this is not Peru. Um, due to unforeseen circumstances, we've switched the this week's presenter to next week. And so um, you'll hear about Peru next week. But uh, today I will be talking about the north and west parts of Iceland. Welcome. And this is the second half of the presentation I did before, so I, I may refer to it like I like you've heard parts already, but you may probably haven't, but that's okay. It's self-explanatory. So this day's trip was comparatively short to some of the driving I've been doing. Um, there's lots to be seen and done in Husavik, so I went there. There was another nice journey ahead. And Husavik's main thing is whale watching, and so I booked a tour there. And whatever particular confluence of circumstances is true of their particular part of the Greenland Sea, means there are like 14 different kinds of whales that come through there. And so they've got a pretty nice harbor for those boats to be in. And of course there's fishing because there's fishing all around. And I had a look around and got suited up because there's a risk when you're out on the ocean that it can get cold and wet. So everybody got these coveralls. And they had a bunch of different kinds of boats for levels of quietness, environmental impact, cheapness, etc. And there's also this sign that I'll have more information about later. There was a Netflix movie shot in Husavik, and that has become its other main tourist draw. Anyway, we set out, and it was a nice warm day. We learned pretty quickly that you don't always need the coveralls. And I finally got a good view of puffins out on the water and on one of their rock faces. And they're cute little guys. I was glad to see them because in the harbor, it seemed like we were going to get skunked. The only things we'd seen so far and that I had missed were some harbor porpoises. And this particular little island is neat because on top of the puffins, it has sheep. Apparently, there's a time of year that I was not there for where they just kind of let all of the sheep loose to graze the whole country down. Now, this puts them at risk, so the ones that aren't good at running need a bit of a safer circumstance. They're brought out to islands like this to do their grazing in a place where they won't get hit by a car or something. But then, finally, there was something. And the humpbacks had arrived. And they'd stick up and breathe and go down. And look at them go. Apparently, these tail undersides have distinct patterns, so the people running the boats get to know which whale is which. And sometimes they have scientists aboard looking and keeping track. And there's the back sticking out. A few more. The birds really do the thing where they hang out over the whale waiting for food scraps. Anyway, we're out here in the bay having a nice time, and it was almost time to go back. But then they heard on the radio, and the crew asked if anyone needed to be back at the prescribed time, or could we instead do something different? And obviously everybody wanted more free bonus whale watching. So um, we turned around and headed further out, joining the other boats in pursuit of something. And up it came, spraying while I was taking a breath, a blue whale. Very long, little fin at the back. We didn't get too close, but it was cool to see the biggest animal that ever lived just out in the wild doing its thing. So then we returned to town and I went up the stairs to the rest of the town above the harbor. Because after all, I've got a schedule to keep. The Husavik Museum had a bunch of little vignette rooms off the main room. One had a polar bear. One had ptarmigans. Another was about fishing. 
And there was an interactive panel talking about each of the different subregions of Iceland, which I did eventually go to all of. There was information about deep sea fish and crabs, seals, different people's jobs and traditional clothing. Another section was through a tunnel of sorts and it was all about boats, bigger and smaller and in varying conditions. And the next place I went was conveniently attached to my hotel. As I mentioned earlier, Husavik was the site of the Netflix movie Eurovision Song Contest, The Story of Fire Saga. So there's an exhibit space that is half about the movie and half about the actual Eurovision Song Contest. And it's attached to a themed bar, so one could bring a beer in there. An advantage, I suppose, to everything being behind glass. And they broke down the history of the event itself, which is known for elaborate costumes and showmanship. And there was a video interviewing the filmmakers and the local people who were involved and enjoyed working on it. The bar was themed and had a bunch of different drinks and things that would surely make a lot of sense if I had seen the movie. Then I went to a restaurant as recommended on my whale watching ticket and had some fish stew. I grabbed some snacks and went looking for good views. If I went up the hill, I could look down on the water and back over at the town. To this day, I'm still not sure if I was supposed to be where I went, but nobody stopped me, so whatever. So I tried to go here on my Husavik day, but they'd closed early for some reason. So instead of that, I went first thing when it opened on May 18th, International Museum Day. And the day of the trip, I went to the most museums in one go. Learned more about whales, including this strange furry creature. The interesting thing about whales is that even though they're in the water all the time, they're still mammals. And the only way they retain those traits is that their ancestors had left the water, gone on land, developed all the mammal qualities, and then decided, that was silly, let's go back in the water. So that furry creature is the first whale, Pachycetus. It lived on land in Pakistan. Then they had a bunch of different washed up skeletons of different types of whales. This is a calf of a Mickey whale. And this is a blue whale, which is why it takes up a whole room and even a rib is taller than me. And this is a narwhal. Their tusks are surprisingly useful sensory organs, apparently. And there's a porpoise and a seal and a sign telling me I should drink tap water. And as soon as I was done there, I took off for Akareri. And this particular waterfall was off the beaten track, I think on someone's land. But it was, I think, one of the nicer ones. So I could say it was worth my time. Saw some neat plants and rocks on my way to another waterfall. This one bigger and more readily accessible. Bunch of different little spouts, lots of flow. And then I resented the idea of paying money for a tunnel. And so I took the long way around down a fjord toward Akureyri and it had some nice views. The other reason to go this way was the Museum of Folk and Outsider Art. It's a neat little place because the space is definitely a museum. Yes, but somebody lives on site at the museum, and so there are spaces you can't go in, and occasionally you'll hear somebody vacuuming or whatever. Here's some interesting work. And it's a nice little foresty nook, so you can look out the window or go on a little bridge thing and see trees and a nice little river. And lots of interesting local art. And the cheap way also has a nice view over Akrari before you come in. But you get to take that nifty bridge either way. 
So I tried to go to the industry museum and the motorcycle museum, but the former wasn't open yet. And the latter wasn't opening at all that day. So I went down the road to the aviation museum. Being a road remote island, one conveniently between Europe and North America, and with a bunch of inconvenient volcano business, flying around the island is essential. This is an Evans VP1 folks plane, which is like a plan that they give you and you make the plane yourself. And I think it turned out pretty nice. And this red one is a de Havilland Dragon Rapide, which was like a fairly reasonable passenger plane, even though it's made of plywood. A lot of the flights in Iceland are by Iceland Air, unsurprisingly, and this was one of theirs. The planes in this museum can also vary a bit because a lot of the functional ones treat the museum as their hangar, but sometimes leave to fly. Then I went downtown, got some fish soup for lunch, and encountered the Nordic fascination with Donald Duck. Akureyri Art Museum was free that day because it was, as I said, International Museum Day. I saw this neat textile landscape. And much of the building had installations. This one was on the top floor, had some different video vignettes with overlapping musical audio. This stuff was on the middle floor, only accessible by the elevator. And then cannons, because museums do love a good cannon. And this was at the actual Akureyri Museum. This location has two floors. I believe the bottom is the history of the town and doesn't change. And the top, I think, changes. It was at least currently about music. And so it was good to see, learn about the town band. Those who know me know I like to see a tuba. And this banner was for one of the local choirs. There were a few choirs in town, and of course they hated each other because that's what choirs do. Uh, this is an instru interesting instrument. Uh, looks like a banjo, strung like a mandolin. Some interesting folk instruments, elaborately decorated case. And downstairs was local history. Of course there was fishing. There were also some historic buildings outside. And this one in particular is the house of Noni, a famous local children's author. And it's a good example of what a house would be like there in his time. And it was finally late enough in the day and I saw I could visit the industry museum. This was an interesting place, not only on its own merit, but because it was one of only like three places I went on the whole trip where the people I encountered only spoke Icelandic. It's really not very difficult to get by without, even though it would have been nice. But little Icelandic I know now, I learned the bulk of it after I got back. I did learn part way in to say hello so I could identify, identify immediately as a helpless tourist rather than hi, which could easily be the Icelandic greeting, hi, leaving them still baffled as to what language to use. One of the things they have is beverages. And so it's interesting to see the progression of the bottles and branding for the local drinks. There was lots of food-related stuff. Here's a mold to make a particular set of candies. And over here is one of these floating bumpers for docking a boat softly. But at the time, they made them out of cork. And the big neon orange plastic ones we use now. And we've got stencils they use to mark barrels and boxes. A hat from KEA and a poster for the museum I was just at before this. Okay, it is the Cooperative Society of Eafjörður and Akureyri, which was a pretty substantial fishing company that owned everything but the church, as was the joke in the area. Honestly, Akureyri reminded me of home. Bit under 20,000 people, significant co-op, good festivals, museums, restaurants, sounds like Swift Current to me. Then I got a raspberry shake at a popular local ice cream shop and drove around town. Went and had a look at the cruise ship I'd seen docked from earlier and spotted a plane taking off. 
Next stop was the Akureyri Botanical Gardens, which had lots of interesting stuff, though my favorite bit was the one showing Arctic plants specifically. It's a pretty big area, nice to walk through. I got a closer look at the church here. Again, these churches look very cool. Nifty round convention center place. I went to Hagkaup, which I'm given to understand is like Icelandic Target. It's a little nicer than Walmart, but it has all the stuff. Then I went to get another hot dog. This one had beans and bacon on it. And luckily a bird didn't take it from me. There are lots of different options available, even the volcanic one with hot peppers and a charcoal bun. And this is, well, I've come to describe John Gunnar Arneson as the Dunk Bentham of Iceland, as it seems he has a public artwork in every town. Reykjavik and Akureyri for sure, but there's one in Stikisholmer that if it's not him, his vibe is clearly what they were going for. Now, this room was interesting, up with a little window to look out on the water and a button to check out because there wasn't a desk or anything. I entered a code to get in the room and pushed that button to leave. No pesky human interaction involved. From here was the journey to the West Fjords in the beginning of not all of the roads being super nice and paved. So I stopped at a tasty bakery on the way out of Akureyri and then didn't go far enough around a roundabout to stop at the nearby gas station and, oh well, it's fine, I figure. I'll go to the next one. Famous last words. Let the record show that if you miss the OB on the way out of Akureyri, the next gas station is the oldest in Varmalid, an hour away. Now, conveniently, the Suzuki Vitara is a hybrid, and that trip is almost entirely downhill. Gravity charged me for the bonus range I needed to get there, but it was touch and go for a while. From there, I continued on to the next museum. The Textile Museum. Or so I thought. Counter to the information on the internet, they were closed. But there was a nice enough view behind them. Went up another neat cliff area down the dirt road because this is where my trip took its own path. And I opted to look for some advertised seal watching areas. But it's nice up here. Rocks and fjords off the beaten path. And here was the first stop, Kvitserkur. It was a neat rock to look at in a good cliff area, but no seals. Nice waterfall, of course, but I've seen those. What I want is seals. A few other spots along the way were outright closed, so I just kind of headed for the seal center. And I found it, and a map telling me the places I had just looked for seals. The key piece of missing information is that they're only there at certain times of season, weather, and tide. It was a cool place though, an opportunity to learn about some interesting creatures. Also bar witness to a woman who had come in utterly convinced that the entire thing was a conspiracy and a front for some kind of seal hunting operation. It wasn't, and the staff had clear and thorough answers for her every question, but as is the case with conspiracy people, she didn't seem any more enlightened for just for having been informed. There was also a temporary show about walruses and a lab where you can watch scientists work on whatever they're doing in a given week. Right now they were working on figuring out what minke whales eat and also they weren't in the lab at all that day. And across the street was what used to be a local general store but has since turned into half a store for local handmade things and half a museum space that contains the contents of the old store mostly unchanged. There were also some more purpose-designed displays upstairs. I like the implication that the massive beard is part of the outfit. From there, closer to the right time, I continued my trek and resumed my search for seals. And this is where I would put my seals, if I had any. But the special thing about this area is less the seals anyway, and more its claim to fame as the spot where Hrafnaf Loki first landed. 
I mentioned him in the previous presentation as as the one who discovered Iceland. He his ravens led him to this spot. And I got to Holmvik, home of the Icelandic Museum of Sorcery and Witchcraft, which of course had some spooky stuff in it. But ultimately was like most examples of historical witchcraft, couched in these were fairly normal local spiritual traditions, but the Christians came and couched it all in negative misinterpretation and scorn. Like with witch trials everywhere, the usual sort of map of people sent away for crimes with shaky evidence and tenuous connection to real negative outcomes. And it's this sort of thing that leaves me suspicious of Icelandic Christianity because I know the stories swear up and down that everyone sort of converted calmly and politely, and there's evidence that the church didn't totally quash their existing spirituality either. But given their track record everywhere else, I feel like they have not earned the benefit of the doubt. Some nice waves outside the breakwater. Then I stopped at a restaurant run by some friendly Scottish expats and got tasty pizza and a cocktail with some Brennivin. Then I went up the hill to the hotel where I was put, a, put in an upgraded room and I mostly just went to bed because I was getting tired and Holmovic doesn't seem like a place big, enough, uh, big on the nightlife. Not like I really did anything most evenings. And I did love to give me these Aurora notifications. Being north, I was in a good spot for Auroras to exist, but it didn't really get dark the whole time I was there. So a lot of good it did me. Nice night rainbows, though. And the view of the town from the hotel on a clear day is pretty nice. And of course, they call it the West Fjords because it's in the West and there are a lot of fjords. So the trip to Isafjordr was definitely longer than its straight line distance. And another just random roadside waterfall. This is just somebody's garage at this point, but it's a cool heritage building. This bridge was cool to look at. And this is a, a thing I'll note for any keeners. Um, if you know how the bridge in Waccamaw is one lane and you kind of have to wait at the end and take turns? Well, most of the bridges in Iceland are like that, even ones that are kind of long. And there are tunnels like that too, though luckily they're getting less common. I think I only did one one-lane tunnel. Just, you know, boring little roadside pull-offs. You're pining for the fjords. This is a worthy destination. Rainbow. And I stopped by the Arctic Fox Center in the morning. I got to look around, but there was some kind of breakfast or tea function going on. And so this was kind of the setup. Come enjoy our taxidermed foxes and enjoy a cup of tea with them. They're a little quiet, but they're good listeners. Outside, there's a little area where some Arctic foxes live that you can see and visit. Or you can if it's not a 60 kilometer hour wind the whole time. They didn't want to get blown around, so they hung out in their capes. And when I got to Isafjordr, I went to this neat old building that is a fish restaurant I'd been tipped to. And they don't really have a set menu. They just sort of cook whatever got caught that day. And it's a buffet, but the seating isn't really standard. It's in these long tables and everybody sits together. And they get some soup and then the rest of the buffet offering. And being too Canadian to strike up a chat with strangers, I ate my fill relatively quickly and got out. It absolutely was delicious though. And I didn't even have to move my vehicle for the next phase because right by the restaurant was the West Fjords Heritage Museum. Not next door though, in between the restaurant and the museum is one random private residence in what is already a strange little heritage nook in the industrial area. As is the case with a lot of history museums and fishing villages, there was a lot to be said about fishing. So that was a lot of the main floor. And there was also some oral history about some local stories, some blueprints and objects. And on the second floor was kind of a layout of someone's home in the area with beds, kitchen, views, even a cat. 
And then the third floor was all accordions because not everyone is great at writing a focused collections policy. Pretty cool though. Many of the people I'd seen in the museum and the restaurant for that matter were wearing matching jackets from their crews. This is an interesting cruise line because they focus on expeditions to interesting places. Iceland, of course, Greenland, Antarctica, Galapagos, West Africa, etc. I went for a walk around town to find that one of the museums I wanted to visit didn't exist anymore, and another was closed. It wasn't particularly productive in that way, but it's a nice place to look around anyway. Some cool looking storefronts. And having been skunked on the museums, I continued northwest to see what I could see in the next town and on the shore. And found a cool outdoor village museum that was, wouldn't you know it, closed. But at least with an outdoor one, you can see the outdoor part. It was a cool little fishing boat and good enough repair to suggest they use it. And then I went down the sketchiest road of all the ones I did this trip and got some nice mountain views. Went past the path to a lookout point because it was impassable in the mud, but continued down past some farms and sheep to a designated bird watching area. And it was still just as windy as it was as the Arctic Fox Center, but the birds here would try their best to handle it. And some sweet waves. Would have been a good spot for a picnic if it weren't both cold and not lunchtime. I headed back to town. This was my view for the night. And on this day, I opt to skip some of the fjords and go straight across. I started the day in a cool nature area. Drove through a chaotic dirt road up a hill and around and down, only to find a big parking lot with a bunch of tour buses and electric car chargers. Ocean plants washed up on the beach. A bunch of gulls and some kind of swan. I'm given to understand there were swans in the park right here at some point, but not anymore. And a nice view where the waterfall lets out into the fjord. Now this area, Dinandisa, is a whole complex of falls leading out. The thing to do is climb up to the top one. There's a nice easy path along beside the rushing water. Dense and fresh over the rocks. And up we go, and you beach the, the big one and take it in for a while. And I went over to find a geocache in the rocks nearby. And it's cool to see the froth over the deep water. Now this was the opposite matter of the textile museum. The internet said the Sea Monster Museum was closed, and that was also wrong because it was open. I liked it quite a bit, actually. It was neat to see an example of how one could make a museum based basically entirely on people's stories without any sort of physical artifact. There were models, big and small, an interactive map table that would show you the locations of different stories and give you bits of information from each. Though I think my favorite part was the guy running the place and just how jazz he was to hear that I'd come from Canada. And when he asked if I knew about Ogopogo, I could tell him I did, and that my family was from there and had had some sightings of their own. After that, I went to check out a beach because before it came time to get on the ferry. It was a little brisk, lots of waves. If you remember, this beach is special because most of the Icelandic beaches are black, and mostly tephra, but this one has some regular sand in it and is brown. Lots of nice smooth rocks and shells too. And a smooth transition down from the hills. And there was some kelp washed up with the shells. And then it came time to line up for the ferry. You may notice the ominous clouds. It stops in Flatte on the way across and then ends up in Stikisholmer. 
As you may suspect from the foreshadowing and the fact that there aren't very many photos from this journey, I didn't have a great time. The ocean, the boat, and the passengers were all heaving in their own ways. I took turns trying to watch the horizon and then just closing my eyes entirely as I heated up. Most of the people on there were having a tough time, except one wonderful soul who was unfazed and spent the whole journey running around people, giving people bags and paper towels. Having a sleep and some breakfast settled me again, and so I had a look around Stukasholmer. So it continues the trend of interesting looking churches. And down here is the requisite shiny boat sculpture. Then I climbed up from the cliff area across the ferry dock from the hotel. The hotel was interesting too, because it used to be a monastery. So it used, it's got a lot of the usual amenities, but it also has a chapel and stuff. And so I saw some neat plants and a little lighthouse up on top. Yeah, there's a new nice view over the town. More uh, basalt column fun times. Lots of people would go here and take their dog out or whatever. It's pretty convenient to the town. Nice mountain views too. Then I went over to get a closer look at the church itself. And from there, I could look back across at where I was. And the library of water was closed at the time I wanted to visit, but I looked in the window. Each of those tubes has water from a different glacier around Iceland. So this is the last day of the lap, and I go the rest of the way back to Reykjavik, but I still make a few stops along the way. The next stop was the Shark Museum, learning about the Greenland sharks and the history of making halkar. They don't hunt them anymore, but this place prepares the food from bycatch. And you can see the roughness of the skin. It's really interesting to see how the teeth are laid out so they can just keep getting replaced as they break. And they had big pieces for sale, though I didn't buy any. I did try a piece in the tour. And if you don't know what halkart is, it's a meal from a shark. It was meat that has to be fermented and let to off gas to make it edible. Because part of the way Greenland sharks are adapted to survive the cold northern waters is they have a lot of urea in their system that works as antifreeze. And this means that if you were to just eat them, it would be toxic. But if you let it turn into ammonia and off gas over time, it's edible and nutritious. The thing is that even when it's ready to eat, it still smells like ammonia. If you eat it with some bread and don't really sniff, the flavor is actually pretty subtle, but the smell is aggressive. And some birds in here, a bit of other information adjacent to the sharks. And over here is the building where they hang the shark pieces outside so they can properly off gas. A nice little view behind the building too. The next stop was Snora Stofa. This is the home of Snorri Sturluson, a major figure in Iceland's history. He wrote much of the Pros Edda and some of the Sagas, and on a couple of occasions, he was the last speaker of the Althingi, which was presumably a holdover role from not having written language or for translating to those who couldn't read. There was someone whose job was to memorize all the laws and say them aloud at government meetings. He also spent some time working for King Hakon the Old of Norway. And there was stuff about Snorri himself and the sagas, but also some amount just about Iceland in the 1100s. There was a space in the back to watch videos as well. And this is where he would bathe. The hot spring water feeds right in to make for a pleasant experience. And I got back to Reykjavik with just enough time to visit the National Museum before it closed. It's pretty neat. It has the whole history of the country laid out mostly in order. The figure on the right, for example, is from a very long time ago and is, of course, laden with speculation. Some say it's Thor, some say it's Jesus, some say it's an Odin-Jesus hybrid, some say it's a non-specific king that's a playing piece in a board game. A cool wooden model of the frame of a church building. Some elaborate altar decorations. Little box of carvings, a side room aimed at kids, 
stained glass in the stairs to the upper floor. And it wouldn't be an Icelandic museum without some form of boat. Some old drawings, a flag, a replica house. I kind of had to rush through as things got more modern because I ran out of time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, tourists love to come to Iceland to see natural phenomena that only exist occasionally. This includes eruptions. I, I got an email from Iceland Air this summer offering a promo on last minute's flights to see the active eruption. The solution both for control of circumstance and safety of hapless tourists is this. Both in Vik and now in Reykjavik, there's the lava show. And they tell you some stuff about lava, then a guy in a crazy heat shielded spacesuit thing goes to the back and sends some lava down a track. See, also it's bubbly because they wanted to show a few different effects. So there's a block of ice under part of the track to flash boil and make bubbles in the lava. It flows down the track, glows brightly, makes the whole room hot, makes cool bubbles. It's still kind of solid, so you can pick it up with the right implement and shape it. Look at it go. Yeah, that's where it's hitting the the ice and bubbling and sparking. Very satisfying to look at. And in these circumstances, it cools really quickly, and so it turns into obsidian. And part of determining what rocks come from lava is the speed of the cooling. And the whole track cools off and you're left with all this volcanic glass. Then they hand around pieces and you look at it on top of the volcano sand in the collection thingy at the end. Once everyone's had a good look, they clean it all up and put it back in the vat for the next show. Occasionally they need to refill with some sand, but for the most part, they can kind of keep recycling this stuff. And from there, I went for a walk around town, went to some souvenir stores and whatnot, and then went to the street food place for some meat soup. Next step was to do the route for more basic tourists. The short lap, the golden circle, has, it has some pretty worthy stuff in it on its own, in its own right. This is Kerith, a volcano crater that formed a nice little lake, red rock caldera. And you can walk all the way around the edge and there's a staircase down to the water too. It was, however, aggressively windy that day, and so I didn't go all the way around. I ogled for an amount of time appropriate to the entry fee and went on my way. Now, the next place I went was the Geyser Center, where I could right or wrong in my personal history. I'd gone to Yellowstone in 2010 on the way back from the tuba conference in Arizona, but Old Faithful was not faithful to me, and I never got to see a cool splash. Until now. It is a uniquely interesting phenomenon to gather with a crowd around a hole in the ground and just kind of wait for something to happen sort of at any point in the next 10 minutes or so. And here it goes. I'm not, well, I'm not sure. I don't know how high Old Faithful is supposed to go. But. Then, um, yeah, I'm going to look at a few more splashy, bubbly holes, and then the weather took a hard turn, <laughs> sleeting sideways, huge crowds panicking and running to the building. Now, I didn't run, but I did walk backwards a long way. And with the weather and that sort of sense of late trip, can't be bothered, I didn't go to the recommended waterfall for this journey. I carried on to Lagerfaden, which is another thermal pool that I didn't swim in. But my goal in visiting was not that, but the rye bread, which they bake by putting ingredients in the pot and burying it. The heat under the ground there is such that it nicely cooks loaves of bread. Very tasty. 
And from there, I went to Gliofrestein, the home of Icelandic author Halder Laxness. I couldn't take any pictures inside, but it was a neat place. You go in and do an audio tour that takes you from room to room, learning about the author and his house. Then I went to one of the set of city-run art galleries in Reykjavik. Lots of what was there this time was student art from art students, but also fashion design, architecture, etc. The building is interesting too, because part of it is what you expect, but part of it's like a tent over the space between buildings. There was a labyrinth and a bike you could ride to take a shower. Big painting of the different kinds of birds you can find. A big wall-sized installation that would have been more poignant if I knew more about Icelandic politics. I think it was climate related. A cool sound and video installation with choirs, a space with grass in it, an interesting lamp you could walk into if you wanted. A button that causes something to happen. And then downstairs in the gift shop were some magnets that if it didn't say Iceland on them, they could easily have been there. Been here rather with the marshmallow bales. All in all, a big, cool, concrete building. Cruises would stop right across the street, convenient them for them to visit here, and that hip food court and some other museums right nearby down the street. It was time for one more supper, so I went to Cafe Loki for some lamb and rye bread ice cream, which sounds suspicious, but I assure you it was very good. Across the street was Halgrimskirke, which is a big very big building, particularly in context. The wind was again hilarious and people were kind of blowing away trying to get their photos, but I poked my head in and saw the interior and the fancy organ before heading to Harpa. Now my evening activity would be at this fancy concert hall, Harpa. It's a pretty cool space and I would go back. Nice views over the water. Had to look back at Dufa, the other side, where I had looked back at this window on the first day. The show was How to Become Icelandic in 60 Minutes, a comedy show that teaches tourists about Icelandic culture, customs, and language, and history in a funny way. And an architectural model of the building. I always love a building that's cool enough that it feels the need to display a model of itself. And... No shortage of good device backgrounds looking around. And that was the last night. Somehow I jammed everything but a cup of soup back into my backpack at the end and was in a position to return successfully, as far as I knew at the time. And took the long way back to the airport to catch a few of the things I didn't see on the first morning. Cool lava fields with rocks and some more of the moss. Some more nice waves. I have to take them in before returning to a home so landlocked that it's where three watersheds meet in the middle. More fields, another lighthouse, a shipwreck. This might just be somebody's farm, but the fence is made of cool rocks, and so maybe it's old. And a close view of a shipwreck. And now, you didn't think I'd pat let my last morning in Iceland pass without fitting in one more museum. So here's the salt fish museum in Grydivik. It was a whole big industry to catch and cure the fish, and it might still be the main thing they do there based on the many industrial buildings surrounding this culture center and museum. Um, now, it was fine at the time I wrote the script. Now this town has been evacuated for volcano reasons. And uh, and it's been kind of a scary time for them. But yeah, they would go in boats like this. And this is uh, another viewpoint where the lava rocks meet the ocean. And whoosh, getting sprayed before I head back. And this sort of tide pool area catches spray and has its own thing going on. Some birds flying over it. One more cool arch rock. And big ones coming in. Hopefully the big winds don't mess with my flight. 
And now I'm glad my time in Husevik taught me about the Eurovision Netflix movie, because otherwise I would have been utterly baffled by these keyboards in the middle of nowhere. They're in place for people to take photos based on a music video that is shot there in the movie. More rock spires. And if you turn back from the ocean here, you'll see this carved stone bird in a lighthouse. The nearby is another field with steam vents and whatnot. It's all blowing in the wind, which helps with the smell, but there's this convenient boardwalk over top. So sci-fi. And look, it's my old friend, the giant crack between Eurasia and North America. They have a didactic on either side explaining a given continent. And there's a track of sand down the middle. If you go further up, there's water and you can swim in the crack. I didn't do that because I had to return my vehicle at like 2.30. And you can stand on this clearly marked bridge right over top of the midpoint. And you can also go underneath it. And the water is just down there. It's a nice spot. Okay, back to Europe, so I can now drive to the North American plate for my flight home. Return the car, walk back to the airport, saw a punny store and an artwork by someone whose work I'd seen the previous day at the gallery. QR cod. I got one more hot dog and took off. So, tragically, I bought some mustard past security at the airport so I could bring it home with me. But my journey was ruined, as all journeys are, by having to stop in Toronto. When you arrive there and go through customs, they don't feed you back into the airport like they do in Vancouver. They dump you through baggage and onto the street, and you have to go through security again, which you cannot do with a nice bottle of imported mustard. And it was made slower yet by the airline forcing me to check my backpack. So I had to wait for the carousel before I could go through. And I was at risk of missing my last leg. Hey, look, Greenland. Anyway, this is roughly the route I took. And so you can see I did have a chance to see much of the country. And it was a worthy experience. And for those curious, the... First half of the talk is on our YouTube channel, so. So thanks.